Hey guys, I got a fun video today. I got a chance to go down to Magnaflow in San Diego, California and get a whole new exhaust put on the truck. Everything from the headers all the way back to the end. So new catalytic converters, new mid pipe and muffler and everything. So awesome opportunity. Thank you so much um, to Magnaflow for having me down there. And this video is kind of just like a vlog of me going down there and touring their insane facility. Um, absolutely crazy. They make everything there. They design everything there. They produce everything there and they ship everything from there all around the world. So this is a crazy facility um, and I had a lot of fun being able to tour around with Rich and he just went through like tons of detail of like everything from development to um, manufacturing to shipping and stuff. So this video is mostly me following him through the factory while he talks through all that kind of stuff. I find that kind of stuff really interesting. I know some of you guys will too, maybe not everybody, but we also install a exhaust system on the truck. And so after we watch the um, installation process and the tour through the factory, we're gonna cut to some clips of how it sounds now and my thoughts on the performance and like sound and all that kind of stuff and future plans. So yeah, we'll start right now with heading down to San Diego and uh, enjoy the factory tour. Keep left at the fork to continue on California 134 East. Good morning, Rich. <laughs> I'll park next to you for now. <laughs> Corporate headquarters in here, uh, just six years ago. Okay. Uh, and where was it before? Spaces. We were in uh, South Orange County, and we just ran out of space. Uh, as you can see, we just keep growing. So. <laughs> you got enough here. Oh, thanks. This is humongous. Okay. <laughs> Came in here and ultimately we, like most businesses, started as a family business. They just kind of bought and kind of expanded into different buildings and uh, we never really had a quote unquote showroom. And we really wanted something that kind of showed what we were about from a cultural standpoint and how the business works, as well as really being an automotive industry uh, showroom. So in the past it was like a front desk and you know, on the holidays you put up a Christmas tree, but it was just that. Uh, when we finally had the chance to design the entire building from the ground up, we wanted it to show some, you know, some level of what we do. So the glass walls and it, it, between all the different apartments is just about communication. We want it to be quick access. You can look right across the hallway and see who's here and we can go into our teaming areas, which I'll kind of show you. Uh, but we also wanted to make sure that, you know, it, it looked like an automotive place should. I mean, we have some of the greatest builders and uh, partners that build amazing cars and we could never show off what they did. So. A lot of what we have here are our influencers and ambassador vehicles, some of our own personal stuff. So we got some Chip Foose collection, you know, TJ Hunt's car. We got some display stuff, our revolver, plus a yeah. Mustang there that can rotate on its side. And That's awesome. See what's underneath it. Uh, but just little elements about, you know, what it is we do and, you know, down to the hand railing, which is stainless tubing that is from our exhaust parts that we help put together. The wire that you see underneath that is the hanger wire. So there's all these little uh, kind of uh, Easter eggs of uh -huh. our culture pulled into what we kind of show as people walk in. So fun wow. stuff. Yeah, I mean, first impression walking in is uh, a little bit <laughs> overwhelming. I was like, oh my gosh, I Most didn't, I didn't realize. It yeah, out of an it's amazing. Company. Yeah, it's huge. So cool. All and right. of course, our latest stuff, uh, you know, we just acquired Camberg back yeah. in December of last year. And you're going to start to see the, the two cultures kind of combine as we, you know, go through automation and really start to integrate all the Camberg manufacturing to all the levels that you're going to see today. Wow. Yeah, that looks amazing. I mean, this, it's so hard not to just love anything, billet and cast. And <laughs> this looks amazing. Wow. Good stuff. It's so cool. Yeah, this is, this is awesome.
All right, check this out. This is so crazy. The truck is up on a lift and we are at MagnaFlow down in Oceanside, California. This is the first time I've had my truck up on a lift uh, where I could look at it. Let's go take a look at the well, stock exhaust because uh, we're replacing the entire thing from the yeah, like two to one tube all back. the way back. Yeah. It's like <laughs> oh, damn. <laughs> Nicely done. That main tube would ignore this chamber that's initially there and feed through all the way to the back first. Yeah. And that back chamber, so there's little perforations here, so it would some of this, the gases would expand and move into these other two, but primarily would go all the way to the back chamber and have to revert and come into this middle chamber, which was capped and tuned at a certain frequency. And then as it passes through, uh, these two elements would push it back into this chamber. So we had one frequency, two frequency, and then two different type uh, pipe sizes for two more different frequencies. And effectively, Nowhere it goes anywhere. <laughs> that's um, what it looks like that's crazy. You have the primary exit being this tube because you can see that's what aligns here. Yeah. Everything has to protrude, uh, uh, flow through all of these perforations and through two chambers, and that's why there's an opportunity to make power. Is this moving back and forth and tuning of frequencies is great for keeping the cabin noise low. Really not efficient, especially now that you have a supercharger. Yeah. Uh, to get the air out. So the biggest change you're gonna see, obviously if you cut open that factory muffler and you saw the back and forth yeah. back travel and we don't have that anymore. Yeah. <laughs> but what you get with our uh, XMOD Universal is the same technology we put into all of our Overland series, which is we have the secondary pathway, which the biggest thing that we've done differently is you saw that they were putting all the tuning in line. So it acted as a restrictor. So it forced all of that gas to go back and forth through different chambers. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to keep that gas path efficient for expulsion of uh, all the exhaust fumes that need to get out. But we created a tuning chamber on the side. And what this allows us to do is change the tune frequency of the muffler. And we can uh, put in a uh, basically a Helmholtz chamber that has a tune length that's about 18 inches. Uh, we have another one that we can double back uh, and tune it at this frequency. And ultimately, we have another uh, our NDC resonator, and this tunes a separate frequency, as well as the tune length that's in here. And this allows you to really kind of dial in the frequency you want to cancel. So depending on your gear ratio, how much load you have in the yeah. vehicle, if you're running empty or that, it takes a 15 millimeter. All you have to basically adjust all this is one bolt. And effectively, this is usually a choose your own adventure. Oh, with that's how you cool. Want to tune it. You can place any one of the devices anywhere, and you can even change the length of this. It's a trombone. So think about it in the effect that the longer you make that uh, tube, uh -huh. the longer the frequency as you're tuning out. The shorter the tube, the higher the frequency. So it's truly as variable as you want. We just give you the most common options based upon what we find are the frequencies that are most disturbing yeah. for most motors. So the kit comes with what pretty much you need to get there. But if you really want to fine tune it, it's up to you on how much detail you want to go into segmenting and cutting this or even lengthening it if you want to tune out lower frequencies. That's so interesting. Well, it's perfect. It's kind of like a do it yourself, uh, tune your own exhaust setup. <laughs> right, and that's really what we did, because you can't choose and, and tune for everything people are doing. Yeah. And when you really get into the world of like off-road, gear ratios, tire yeah. sizes, how much weight we put in these things. Choice of music. It is yeah, that's super cool. This is kind of where things start. We have two other aspects on the R&D side where we have our testing and then we have our metrology room. And uh, metrology being the, the study of numbers is where we do all like the data acquisition portion of it. So that's laser scanning and creating the CAD data and even going so far as doing rapid prototyping of sampling parts that we 3D print. So uh, we'll start here because this is I think where everybody's most familiar and obviously you'll see all number of cars here. We have our catalytic converter business which you'll see some of the less performance cars but uh -huh. the ones that keep you know the businesses running and people going back and forth to work. Uh, and then we have some of our fun stuff you know and then obviously you'll see the truck element. We're going to be on that lift doing what we do. Uh, but here, you know, this is where you pull the parts off. We get an idea of how to assemble pieces. And uh, a good example, we've been working on Mustang pretty heavily. It's the new platform here. So we like to dissect what's going on in the factory parts and then understand the different things that they're doing before we go across and start building our own replacement parts. And we test everything. You know, we look at things such as scavenging with X pipes versus H pipes, what kind of muffling we need to create the sound we're working at, how do we integrate multiple valve systems mm -hmm. so that you can have something that's quiet or loud, but we do all that here in this part of the building. As we go into the metrology room, this is something that's a little less familiar, uh, but it's in line with really 
the highest tech stuff. Uh, might be a familiar vehicle. Yeah, seen that one before. <laughs> uh, and we're currently working on their latest iteration of their multi-valve exhaust system. Uh, but in this room, you'll notice a couple different things. It's got a ceiling, it's a little more insulated. We have a little bit different equipment in here. Uh, and you'll see here we have what's called a blue light laser scanner. And what this device does is we can put any number of OEM parts, parts that we've designed, <clears throat> we lay them on the turntable, and it literally takes a digital picture and it creates a cloud map so that we have a complete, uh, complete capture of it in 3D world. Also, we can flip that upside down, go under the vehicle mm. and scan the underside of the car. So now we have exactly what it should fit and how it's supposed to be built, completely data logged. And in the world that we live in now, we're, we're building rapid prototype pictures and, uh, pictures, uh, fixtures, excuse me, and parts. <clears throat> we drop something, now that's our, that's kind of our, our mold, so to say, uh -huh. and if it gets damaged, now we gotta go re-procure a new car. Now we have a digital model, yeah. so we are always prepared to go out and build new parts. That's super nice. Yeah, that's crazy. It's like the dream garage setup in here. Well, yeah, <laughs> when you look at the fact we can build anything next door with weld and fabrication, yeah. we come over here and we have all of our rapid prototyping 3D print stuff. Yeah. We can basically take something as simple as, hey, the marketing people want to see what a dual tip looks like on a car, yeah. and we can build and assemble these parts here and physically put it on the car within yeah. a number of hours, yeah. rather than having to go source this, build this, and no, say, totally. hey, you know what? That really wasn't the look we were looking for. We just waited two weeks for the parts. We've lost that time. We have this in a matter of yeah. hours. On a much smaller scale, my brother just got a 3D printer. We printed something that's on the truck right now. Uh, well, <laughs> He's it, got a little Bamboo Labs like oh, uh, yeah. printer. Yeah, it works really good. And, and you'll see we run a number of different types of printers. Those are all the Mark IV uh -huh. We have the SLA printer in the corner. Ooh, yeah, so he was mentioning. Whatever we need, we got. And actually, let's go take a look. I can yeah. show you a little bit on the engineering side. Obviously, this is where we do all the data capture and printing. But our research and development team, uh, all of our engineers work up front. And in the CAD room, We'll have a number of different things that you can see. Uh, we had some stuff in the motorcycle business who we worked with, and again, sort of in the tip world, we can go and print an SLA yeah. tip, but we can see how the finished product looks identical to it. Yeah. Um, but we can now test this well before we have to go through the machining process. Totally, and flow and all that kind of stuff. Uh, we can source uh, a part, but we can also take the factory part and create something similar that we can put on the vehicle to verify, yeah. hey, can we use this? Or even better yet, we can go to a sourcing catalog. If they have the data, we can print this to make sure that it actually physically fits rather than just looking at the dimensions. Oh, nice. Like, a, like almost like McMaster car like stuff, print it out so yep, it's actually real. Yeah, they have real. all that data built in there. Yeah. And from that PDF file, we can take all that information and do a, a true fit in real life and know that, hey, we don't have to wait that time, wait the shipping, yeah. pay for anything until we actually know it fits. Do they have the models in that? In uh, a lot of those do have models. Oh, that's kind of cool. because that engineering might just drawings like... and downloads. So no way. Now that you got your 3D yeah. printer, <laughs> you're like, doing a lot more testing I think that. so. That's pretty crazy. Um, this part here, uh, I can't show much uh, of on camera. OK. Uh, but just for your understanding, Gotta turn it off. Uh, this is Bug? The, uh, yeah, that is actually funny. <laughs> Someone wanted to see what it looked like, so uh, <laughs> June bug it looks like. Yeah. Top secret development. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know this is the inside of part of a catalytic converter, right. but it's crazy just how much, just from visually looking, how much restriction there is just because how much material there is. You can so most of the time there. this is what we see in a bad cat, and you're like, hey, it doesn't look that bad, right? Uh -huh. Well, when you take it apart. Oh, no way. So when we talk about a, uh, a melted cat, uh, this is ceramic. So, so interested to see what's inside mine. Melting point is like 1600 degrees to take ceramic and turn it to liquid. So okay. you can see that's what this was. So this is glowing underneath the car when it failed. And there's Very safe. A couple things <laughs> that caused this. And like I said, it's funny though, because this is all happening behind what's going on here. So you look at this and you're like, well, my cap doesn't look bad, but yeah. realistically speaking, you can't quite see what goes on until you get underneath it. But this is what would cause uh, bad airflow. So it would be sluggish. So you'd be driving and you hit like 2,000, 3,000, and just feel like you're hitting a wall. You're pressing the gas yeah. and it's just not going anywhere. The bad part is we're adding more fuel to this fire. Yeah. Because uh, all that fuel's coming in here. It's trying to burn all that excess fuel off and it's just getting plugged up and further stoking this and just turning it into a furnace. And obviously that does not flow well. No, that is so <laughs> crazy. I'm so interested if we can cut mine open and see what, what's going on in there. We can definitely check out what goes on. And that's what we're doing here uh, is under the microscope. You can kind of see, and there's some things that we look at. Uh, so we're looking at that piece, you know, the magnification brought up. And basically <laughs> we're looking at, you know, the different types of structures that are available in airflow. 
this is a, a, like a traditional square style uh, substrate. And as you look, there are different types out there. And they're kind of hard to see with the naked eye, but the, the microscope here makes everything that much easier to look at. Classic technology sound going on. Yeah. And you'll notice this is a, a hexagon shape. Yeah. And the, the structure in and of itself, the biggest thing that we're looking at is if you notice the, the difference between the two uh, is the coating is nice and even all the way around. When it's square, it tends to build up in the corners, which wastes a lot of material. Uh. This actually keeps a more even structure, which means we can put uh, a certain amount of material that we're not wasting in the corner, which brings the price down so that we're not charging the consumer for stuff that's doubled up in the corner. So if you that makes sense. look back at this again, you'll see that... Um, You have that buildup in the corner, so that's just extra material. Oh, yeah. And then because of that shape, it's actually getting very thin here. We have to make sure there's complete coverage, so we have to build it up in the corner. So as technology's moving on, there are newer things that we can incorporate. And also, the hexagonal structure is physically more resistant to uh, forces of cracking and stuff yeah, like yeah. as well. Yeah, that so, makes sense. Uh, hard to see with the naked eye, but there's a lot going on, uh, even inside of the types of materials. Uh, this is a metallic, as they call it. So this is built like a corrugated piece of cardboard. And we take a flat piece and a corrugation, and it's brazed together, and we get a similar type structure. But the biggest thing you'll notice is you see how much more open it looks. Yeah. This is a much higher airflow type of device. So this one's made for a smaller tube, something that you might find like in a motorcycle head pipe. Yeah. Or small internal combustion motors that are used for like generators and things oh, as well. Oh, okay. Versus your more traditional, uh, I think this is actually like a GM, yeah, yeah, here, a Cadillac. Um, and that's, I would say, probably what they call a uh, 400 CPI or 400 cells per square inch type substrate. Wow. And as the car needs to have more emissions control, we need more surface area, the density will change to something that'll be a little more tight. So that's probably like a 600 uh, to something that's like this, which could be close to like a 900. Oh my so gosh. Very tight. Uh, and we see a lot of these kind of like in uh, the high output, like import vehicles, Porsche, Mercedes Benz, really? where they need more time and they have more fuel passing at a higher pressure to do more conversion. But so much restriction, it looks like. But that's why it gets bigger. Okay. So that's oh, where more. you look at it, because it's pretty wild to think. You know, we, we think about restriction in, in a sense of, well, we look at a very small area, we compare, well, that to this, right? Yeah. But when we say, well, the surface area is, we have a tube that's in here and we're opening that up to, you know, five inches of diameter versus oh, you know, right. four inches of diameter, this can actually flow the same. Yeah. And it will provide better emissions control. And that's ultimately what we're looking at. Because that might time. be like a two and a half inch pipe going into a five Correct. inch chamber right. or something. Okay. So all that Double surface volume. area that, yeah. Yeah, that we're getting that airflow through. So that's all part of this <laughs> process in determining what it is we do. Crazy. Like Onward. I said, you don't typically, it's not usual to go through and see a bunch of guys in lab coats dealing with yeah. chemicals in an exhaust company, but we do it from the engineering side up. Yeah. This is the top secret. Okay. In the cat world, we have an inanimate object. You gotta think, the engine's got valves, camshafts, crankshafts, pistons, all moving in unison, thousands of parts uh -huh. to create this pump that burns fuel and creates horsepower. The cat, we saw it, is just an inanimate object which has to do the same thing through chemical bonds and the actual chemistry. So while we have that fuel coming down, and these are, this is happening thousands of times uh, in a minute, and that fuel comes down, it's running rich, it cools off that cat and it changes the structure of the cereal, which is that wash coat. And basically, as it comes along and cools that down, any of the stored oxygen from the lean cycle gets released. So the oxygen that's bonded to the chemical that we put in the cat it, when it cools down because the fuel coming through, and I know it sounds kind of crazy that the fuel passing through the cat acts as a coolant, but that liquid cools that down, releases the oxygen, and then as that uh, catalyst does its job, those are those precious metals, it reacts with the residual heat and amplifies the heat, so we get heat, fuel, and air, and it burns off what's there. That next cycle that comes down from the engine might be now lean, because if you watch O2 sensors, you see they do this. They mm -hmm. go rich lean, rich lean, rich lean. So while the car is running lean, there's a surplus of oxygen, and then oxygen comes by that cat, and that washout goes, oh, we're running hot, lean. It goes through and it chemically changes uh, whatever the formulation that we have proprietary to that motor, and it attracts that oxygen, holds it. And then mm. it holds that oxygen until that next pulse comes by that's rich, and then when it cools that pulse, we now release that oxygen, 
and it's doing the same thing that pistons, valves, and spark plugs are doing at the engine, but chemically behind without moving parts. Wow, that's wild. As an engineer, that's the fascinating part to me. Yeah. You've got to do that chemically to which what we do in here is all mechanical. Yeah. So the temperature change is what controls like whether or not it's retaining or, or releasing oxygen? Correct. Crazy. And that formulation depends on the engine. Yeah. Because some motors burn hotter and colder. The yeah. amount of airflow, all of that will dictate what's right. And that's why the guys in the lab coats over there got the degrees they do. Yeah. Is they figure out what yeah. is the optimal <laughs> chemistry to make sure that we can have that uh, combustion happen. Above my pay grade there. Even above my <laughs> So back here is oh, where yeah, all, all the fabrication shop. portion happens. Like I said, this is the very familiar part where we have to build our fixtures for manufacturing. Yeah. Uh, so anything that comes off the vehicle here that we do any testing on is going to eventually come off the vehicle and yeah. go into production here. Oh, this is my dream to have a be able to have a lift in the shop and just like lift stuff up and <laughs> work on things. It's just the fact of being able to not crawl to see all the damage you've done yeah. out of your car a fascinating thing. How many parts do you ship a year? So here, this is where we do all of our shipping and it's international. All the stateside stuff and we ship to all the other countries around the world. Uh, and we ship basically 2.1 million parts on average a year out of this facility. And uh, as you'll see where the guys are just going on break, there's only about a dozen people that work in this facility. And we work from like five o'clock to two o'clock, obviously West Coast, that's yeah. what ships us most everywhere. Uh, but the system is completely automated and we'll kind of walk around. Uh, we have connections with all of our different distributors so we can actually ship from our inventory. You'll see stuff from AutoZone yeah. there and different vendors. Um, and we can tap into our inventory and we can ship direct to their customers in our drop ship program. But everything you see here uh, goes out to any number of different outlets, whether it's direct to consumer or our distributor network. Uh, you'll see all the bays. We load up all these trucks and daily we're moving all of this stuff that you see here. This is what's going out in today's load. <laughs> Whoa, what? That is so crazy. Yeah. That... <laughs> That's so crazy. It's just weird when you like... The quantities. Yeah, you're like, okay, yeah, I could... You know, you sell like an entire store of clothing or something. You're like, you can wrap your mind around that, but it's like you're selling this is just 2.1 million parts, parts yeah. like of exhaust that you're just yeah. like, who's buying it? It's crazy how well, many. It's pretty wild too. So when we look at this area, uh, you're gonna find that you're not gonna see a lot of dust here. Yeah. Uh, this is our A mover and B mover section. So these are things that are turning every month. Wow. So you can find anything from, you know, 10 million to 14 million, depending on the mix. Yeah. A product, but if you notice, you're going down here, there's no labels. Everything's barcoded, and as we make a left through here, you're gonna see that not only is there a lot as you go up 45 feet on these shelves, yeah. but when we get to the conveyor system where the smaller parts are, you'll find different products in the same zone. Good example, down here, there's three different products. There's no one home for anything, so we can put things wherever they fit, and through the computer system, it'll basically dictate with a little GPS on the people that are running around, where they can find that part number in its closest location. No so if way. it's got three homes and his route doesn't pass two of them, it's gonna tell him to pick from this location. No way. So the efficiencies are, have to be really high. That is crazy. Yeah, this place is humongous. <laughs> that is crazy. Yeah, and this is where it gets a little more dense, obviously with the smaller products here, uh, the picking system, obviously we're not talking about the big boxes that require forklifts. Uh, but the mufflers, the catalytic converters like we're putting on your vehicle, they all kind of live down these aisles. And like I said, even in this one zone, you can put any number of products. The yeah. computer knows where every single one is. And based upon the guy picking, it'll find the spot closest to him so we're the most efficient. That is wild. For the cat that you have, you can see this is where it starts. You're literally watching the clamshells come uh -huh. together and that ceramic substrate that we formulate being put into the first part of the system. And uh, the first machine you see here is basically going to align the shells so that they're perfectly square and do a tack weld. And literally what we're looking at here, this whole machine's only job is to make sure that those two go together perfectly and they don't drift. Once it comes through this part, uh, the next part we're going to be working on is going to be the tractor weld. And here we're seam welding the side. And that's going to join the two halves together that have already been tack welded. The next thing we do is we size the inlet and outlet, and that puts a mechanical fit so that the welding becomes easier. 
And the welding process here is super easy. Uh, basically, we go to both sides and we just do a rotation. So we have two mechanical welders on the inside. The operator simply aligns it and presses go. It rotates 180 degrees and basically does the weld on both sides. What you see coming out is going to be uh, the inlets and outlets welded. And then we go through QC, so 100% of everything, because we've joined a bunch of parts together with welding, is to make sure it doesn't leak air. we got O2 sensors. If we're introducing oxygen because of a bad weld, we now have a cat that's not operating in optimal conditions. And we watched <laughs> what it looks like inside when you get too much yeah. oxygen and uh, other kinds of uh, gas intrusion. So we go through, we run a pressure check to make sure there's no leak downs, and then we're good to go. come out where we have the right amount of penetration, the heat signature is perfect, it doesn't waver like you would with a hand part, and there's very little spatter. So they can go immediately into packaging, which you'll notice, they can come right off of assembly, right into a box. Yeah. Comes the bodies and the caps that you have. And you can feel that machine when you're next to it. 200 tons, of course. This facility is absolutely crazy. It's like humongous and state of the art and just has every machine you can imagine. And everything's done in house from steel rolls coming in here to everything being produced like right here, which is wild. But right now we just took out the old exhaust and we're putting in the brand new exhaust. I'm so excited. I could tell just from what I've learned walking around with Rich with flow in the stock exhaust versus their new one is gonna be way, way better. So super excited for this. I can't wait to see how it affects the performance of the truck and uh, it's getting installed right now. Yeah. I'm super excited. a lot louder. <laughs> yeah. Maybe. It's below 2000, it seems to be okay. Yeah, below 2000, it's good. But at 2000, it seems like it's like, like uh, loud enough to feel like pressure on my ears, kind of. Service you get at Magnaflow. You get rich working on your car in the parking lot. <laughs> Whatever it needs. 
needs to get done. <laughs> All right, so Rich and I just got back. We did about four or five loops around the HQ here, and we were just working on tuning the exhaust and changing some of the parts out that come in the kit, and it made a humongous difference. So I'm gonna have Rich kind of just explain a little bit, uh, you know, what's happening when we're changing those parts out and why it makes such a big difference and how you can do this at home as well. One of the big things to realize about the technology is it doesn't require a whole lot of science behind it. We've done all the hard work and we kind of gave you three starting points and effectively the technology works by creating the sound you don't want. So when we make that J pipe that hangs off the side and we create um, a wavelength and we're looking at you know lower frequencies have uh, like a 20 hertz cycle is something you would consider like a subwoofer noise. Uh, something that's 20,000 hertz is a very high pitched tweeter. And if you think about it, when we're talking about frequency, the name implies that it's a certain number of repetitions per second. High frequency is means you have many of them, 20,000 hertz. Low frequency is 20. But what we're doing is we have a longer wavelength. So the best way I can describe it is if you've seen like a trombone, because you'll actually look at the way our U-pipe is made, the longer it gets, the lower frequency we're creating. And if we want to cancel that frequency, we just got to figure out which one of those lengths, the one that's got cap, the one that's got the J-pipe with the cap, or the one that's got the J-pipe with the NDT resonator, and that'll cancel the lowest frequency and we work our way backwards, which is exactly what we did. So we found what our ears said were the right things. We didn't need to do the math. We didn't have to figure out some kind of scientific approach. We put all the tools in the box so you can just literally go in, take a 15 millimeter, and as you saw, crawl into yeah. the vehicle. And in a matter of minutes, yeah, you can have maybe. night and day <laughs> results. Impact, yeah. Yeah, that was, that was amazing. I mean, because when we first headed out, it was like, oh, sounds good, but wow, this is way too loud for me and like, it's really in my ears. And you're like, no problem. We just went back in, swapped in an extra resonator to just reduce volume and then started just playing with like the length of those things. Yep. It makes a huge difference, which is, I think if you haven't experienced like how much of a difference it is. Uh, kind of hard to hard, describe. It's hard to describe because like the, the resonance that, that you don't want feels like pressure on your ears mm -hmm. and then swap out a part and you're like, Oh, like you can, it's like someone turned off the white noise or right. something. So right. yeah, that was a really neat experience. And this whole experience just being here at Magnaflow has been amazing. It was like eight hours in and we've been just working on the truck the whole time. So it's kind of the fun stuff. Don't tell my yeah. boss. <laughs> awesome. Thank you, Rich. Seriously. Yeah. No Appreciate worries. It. Yeah. Pleasure. Yeah. Okay. Here's scenario number one, and that is just driving dirt roads. Um, I'm going 15 miles an hour, 15 to 20 miles an hour very mild it's definitely louder than stock where stock was pretty much uh, you could hear the engine over the exhaust you couldn't hear almost any exhaust note now you have like an actual exhaust note you don't really hear the engine except for possibly a little bit of supercharger whine um, especially when you're in low range but the exhaust is definitely louder than the engine now, but off-road, I really like it. It's not overpowering, it's not super loud. It doesn't drone or anything, it just has a little bit more of like a performance note. Um, you can kind of hear it like a little bit more. I hope the microphone's picking that up. I don't know if it's canceling it out or not, but definitely a little bit more fun off-road. We're at that lower RPMs uh, to, you know, 1500 to 2500 you can step on it and it kind of gives you a little bit more of like a performance note, which is fun. Hopefully that gives you a little bit more of an idea of what the exhaust system sounds like in the truck and outside.
outside of the truck. I watched these clips back right after filming them and realized just how hard it is to really hear the exhaust through the camera microphone and even the road mic I'm using. I think it just kind of cuts it out <clears throat> um, as background noise. So I'm not sure how well it's translating, but in the car, off-road, it sounds really good. I really like it. Um, at the moment, on the freeway, it's a little bit loud, and I talked to Rich about that, and he said, anytime I wanna come back down there, we can adjust it a little bit, or maybe even put like a slightly heavier muffler in it um, to just quiet it down a little bit. I think a lot of that might have to do with <clears throat> where I had the exhaust end, like where it's dumping, which is actually right before the rear axle. So I think that has to do with a lot of the volume. Um, if we had it going back farther from the cab, I think that would help a lot because these trucks have such thin walled like cabs behind the back seat that you really just hear like a ton through that. So yeah, overall, super happy. Very thankful to Magnaflow for having me out there. Awesome quality products, awesome facility, and just a really neat experience. So that is the exhaust on my truck, and uh, I'll see you guys in the next video.